Hello, everyone. Um, just a show of hands, who didn't come to my last presentation? Okay. Oh, wow, a lot more people than I thought. Well, <clears throat> you missed out. <laughs> um, in the first presentation, I talked a lot more about why I'm doing this crazy expedition, and I showed y'all pictures of the ocean rowboat, and now I'm back for round two with the, uh, with the boat in the flesh. Um, after, like he said, after this, y'all can go check out the boat and I can talk further. And if anyone wants to come aboard and check. Um, so, I, <laughs> I haven't rowed across an ocean yet, but I've gotten frequently asked questions about ocean rowing. So I'll do my best to answer them with uh, the planning and preparation done. So, this is my boat. Her name is Evelyn May, which was my grandmother's name. And uh, that's her in England. She was bought in England. Oops, let me just go back. Um, which is a place number one ocean company in the world. I got the best uh, that I could because when I'm rolling around the middle of the Pacific, I'm really going to want the best boat that I could find in the world. This boat is a completely unique boat. There's no other boat like it in the entire world. Rannoch only built one boat like this. So they have R15 models and R20 models. There's a single rower and a dual rower. And this boat is what I call an R15. Sign, Heinz 57 combination. I only put one hiker, so I recognize her anywhere in the world. She's a unique boat going on a trip. So, frequently asked questions will start in order of survival. So, how will you get water? That's the number one thing. Um, in the fore cabin, and during you might not be able to see as well, so I got some pictures here. A shinker desalination osmosis water purification system. So it goes through. <coughs> so this is the intake for it. The hole in the bottom of the boat. The it goes these fil three filters here, and then it goes into this NASA-looking bit of equipment here, where the actual desalination happens. The wastewater goes out the side, and the fresh water comes out through a small tube on deck. It makes about a gallon an hour and it runs off a solar panel. So, um, yeah, probably the most expensive piece of equipment on the board other than the boat, but uh, kind of like that. Um, in the event that my solar panels do fail and I don't have electrics, I will have a manual desalination pump on board, but then I'm going to have to pump for up to two hours a day, which is not ideal. And every ocean rower in the world has tried to hook up their manual desalination unit to the rowing seat but no one has been able to pull it off yet, so I don't know. Maybe I'll think about some way to rig that on the ocean. Um, food, the other thing, order. Another question I get a lot. So the math that I did here is about 300 calories rowing for someone of my body size. Probably be a lot more for most of y'all. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, and if I'm going to row about 12 hours a day, that equates to 3,600 calories um, a day just for rowing. Add another 400 calories on top of that just for general existing because, of course, when you're at sea, you're doing this all the time just to remain right. Um, so it equates to about 4,000 calories a day, which is about the maximum amount of calories that someone my size can literally process in a day. So I'll probably have to be doing some force feeding. So I'm going to try to get some delicious things. Um, this freeze-dried food uh, is mostly what I'm going to eat. I call it astronaut food. So freeze-dried food goes through a bit of a different chemical process than like a dehydrated food, like beef jerky that you would make in your dehydrator. Freeze-dried food gets put in a special machine where it gets heated up all the way until all the water evaporates and then super cooled. And then once it cools back to room temperature, it's now freeze-dried and non-perishable for years. Um, so I'm eating that and they're actually really tasty. <laughs> and storage for the food, um, since it's a two-person rowboat and I'm only one person, obviously, I have storage for, I estimate, 10 to 12 months worth of food on this boat. I'm going to show y'all when we get out to the boat, but I can actually fit my entire body inside this main locker here. It's my little party trick. Um, Here's my stove. Uh, it's on a gimbal, of course, since I'll be rocking at sea. And then oil in a small propane tank that hooks into that gimbal. I don't need the food, the stove to work to rehydrate my food, but it's, it's good for the troops to have some hot coffee every now and then. Don't worry, I'll be taking questions later. <laughs> See it in your eyes. Um, sleeping. So the aft cabin, I can fit inside of it, obviously, but there's nowhere to put my feet. 
in the main cabin, there's like a little space underneath. Slap my little feetsies down in. Uh, that's sort of command central here. It is quite cozy. When I am sleeping, of course, if the water is shallow enough that I can drop a ground anchor, then I will. But most of the time, if I'm in the open ocean especially, the, the water will be way too deep. So I'll drop what's called a para anchor, which some of you might be familiar with if you do boating. Um, basically just looks like a parachute and fills up with water and it slows your drift. Uh, so while you sleep, you don't lose those hard-earned miles. Cozy home. Let's see. Uh, so like I mentioned, everything is solar on this boat this little self-contained floating island. So you kind of have to boat like a spaceship. I do call it the spaceship because it sort of looks like anything outside of this boat is a hostile environment. You can't get very far away from your spaceship. You have to remain tethered to your spaceship at all times and it has to be a self-contained unit. Obviously that's why I've got are my solar panels. So there's two solar panels and two deep cell marine batteries associated with each, each panel. The panels are separate from the other so if I lose one panel or one battery I still have an entire half of an electric system. So there's the panels. I can choose which panel I want to pull from. Maybe based on the angle of the sun. Maybe the sun is at a better angle than the other, so I'll pull from that one. These are my battery voltages and how much charge is remaining, and those are the batteries down in one of the lockers. Okay, that's just the command center um, in the aft cabin. It's got all my equipment in there. I rather like my command center. I'm, I'm a pilot, so I like I like flipping switches. It makes me feel like fun. So here's all my circuit breakers, fuses, battery. Here's VHF radio, GPS chart plotter, um, charging ports, all my fuses are going to run all my electrics. And yes, I do have spare fuses. Uh, that's just a chart plotter. Um, it's Ray Marine. It's not Garmin, but it'll do the trick. Maybe I'll be sponsored by Garmin one day. Or maybe I'll be sponsored by Ray Marine. <laughs> so that's the, the unit. I took a picture here when I was at my grandpa's house in sunset, showing me in sunset. This is the external display for the GPS. It's not showing anything because I was in the garage at the time, but so when I'm rowing on deck, obviously I can't see the GPS chart plotter. So these are my external displays that will show me speed over ground, course over ground, water depth, temperature, stuff like that. And then obviously a whiskey compass. Um, here's a, a setting. I, I threw this in here because I get this question a lot um, about the GPS. If I'm sleeping and a boat comes near, I can set this for a collision avoidance alarm and I can say, okay, I'll go off if a boat comes within two miles of me. It'll make a really loud beeping sound. There's also a drift alarm on here, so if I start drifting too much, my anchor starts dragging, it'll go off. Low fuel remaining alarm, and I probably won't use that. Um, this is, I took a picture of this because y'all probably won't be able to see this if you don't actually get inside the boat. This is the rudder locker. It's all the way in the aft of the boat, so in my cap in me that has the rudder in it. Um, it's actually a pretty big locker because that arm needs room to swing around. Um, I have two different kinds of rudders. I didn't put this in the slideshow, but I obviously have it outside. I have a fixed rudder, I call it my open ocean rudder, and a coastal rudder which comes up on a spring much like a dinghy rudder. So the fixed rudder goes into this locker here. It comes up through the bottom and it bolts in with this arm here. And it can attach to the auto helm. Sorry, it's kind of dark. The autopilot right here. The coastal rudder, I actually had custom designed for this expedition. So the guys who built these boats, I mean, you have to understand these boats are made to cross oceans. They're not made to follow lines or go island hopping in the Caribbean. So the guys at Randolph Adventure said, okay, you're going to be doing a lot of coastal rowing. We're going to design for you a rudder that comes up on a spring. So if you're rowing by and you're like, wow, I'd like to go dock on that Gary Larson Island right there, you can just, this little, one little palm tree, then you can pull up and that spring rudder will come up. And like I said, I have that on my boat if you want to check it out. That one does not connect to the auto helm though, so I have to steer that one manually. This is just the radio uh, boat for the auto helm, so I can adjust it from the rowing station. Um, emergency procedures. I'll demonstrate this when we get out to the boat. Um, but these boats are built to self right within seconds when they capsize. And I've watched videos of these boats capsizing. They, it really is within seconds. They're just like... It's really cool. However, um, the only reason that these boats wouldn't self right really is if either cabin gets flooded with water, it, like you left the door open. So there's only two rules on this boat. The first rule is you're always tethered. 
right? Because if you get separated from your boat, it's game over. The second rule is you always, always keep the doors closed. Because if your cabin gets flooded, you might capsize and be stuck at the bottom of your boat. So let's say you were uh, leaving your cabin and at the wrong time and a wave came in and your cabin got flooded, your boat flipped, and now you're sitting on the bottom of your boat with a cabin filled with water and a door open below you. So what do you do? So I had installed this uh, bilge pump and it starts, the, the tube starts here. This is the very top of the aft cabin, which if you're inverted would then be the and, and the tube goes down and then the scupper on the side of the boat and comes out this side. This little stick you put, put into your bilge pump here and you start manually pumping. So let's say you're on the bottom of your boat. What you do is you get in the water, swim underneath, close the door, open the vent, swim back out on your way out, you grab your stick, and now you're on the side of your boat and you start pumping. And hopefully you can just get, you just gotta get water out and air in, and if you do that long enough, hopefully the boat will come back around. Your electrics might be fried, but at least your boat is, is, is upright. So that's an emergency. Um, another thing I don't have a picture of, because I don't have yet, is what we call a grab bag in ocean rowing. I'm sure we have grab bags in sailing too, but I'm not a sailor. And that's just gonna be on the X boat that has my life raft and then all my emergency survival equipment in it. So if I can't get in my boat in the emergency, I have the grab bag on the exterior of the boat. Okay. So um, what sort of training have I done? I, I, I mentioned I have not rowed across any ocean. Um, I have done rowing. Uh, the people who were here last time know that I've rowed about 5,000 miles down the Missouri and Mississippi rivers and then along the coastline on the ICW to Texas. I've also rowed a bit in the Amazon and done a cycle trip. I've been adventuring for about five years and it's just sort of accumulated that now I'm a, a graduating, if you will, to uh, greater expeditions. I have done training so far, I went to England last fall and spent six weeks there doing training. I took an RYA Sea School course. We did survival. I got my marine radio license. Uh, what else did we do? Uh, navigation and seamanship. We deployed life rafts. We did the whole thing. And I went out in the sea and I did, um, I did some sea trials in my boat there. It was, it was a bit choppy, but that's nothing like I'll experience later on. Um, so I went out and did some sea trials and got to know the boat a little bit and then I had a whole list of things to do after I went and did my sea trials and figured out what I wanted on the boat. Yes. No feathering, right? Uh, no feathering on the ocean rowboat, yeah. Uh, just, it's just too much. Uh, it, it, it'll, eventually your wrists are going to give out. That's more for racing. Um, can I go to the next one? Wait, where are you going? <laughs> um, so this is going to be a westerly circumnavigation around the world. So the, this whole idea started, anyone who has done a descent of a river from source to sea, as we call it, from the headwaters to the ocean, understands why I'm doing this expedition. Because anyone who's paddled a river from a baby all the way till we are in salt water has had that thought, even if it's just half a second, and they think, what if I keep going? And what if I just keep going? So that was the thought that I had when I finished the Mississippi River. And so I was looking at the Gulf of Mexico and I was thinking about what I wanted to do. Maybe I could do a lap of the Gulf of Mexico, something like that. And then I decided, well, if I get an open ocean rowboat and I spend all this money, when I get to the Yucatan, I'm probably just going to want to keep going. And if I keep going, then I could get to Panama. And if I get to Panama and I'm in an open ocean rowboat, then I can cross the Pacific, which has been done in a rowboat. And then it just sort of snowballed from there. And I was like, you know, I could probably just go around the world. So uh, that's how crazy I'm. Uh, <laughs> uh, I really like these, ma these maps, especially of the poles, because it really uh, shows how much of my route is going to be in the southern hemisphere. Um, I, this route will probably change, um, but this is sort of the rough draft that I have right now. Okay. Where did this idea? I already talked to you about that, but that's uh, the map of all my previous expeditions. Uh, that's the Amazon, here's the Missouri and Mississippi. I did a 5,000 mile bike tour in Europe and then rode along the ICW. Um, how are you funding this? Great question. How are you funding this? Um, <laughs> Well, <laughs> I have been working two jobs for the last few years. 
Uh, I'm a flight instructor, so all of my expeditions have been self-funded. This one obviously is a bit more expensive than what I've been doing. Um, so I, did, I opened a nonprofit, and a nonprofit in January of 2021. I've gotten about $20,000 of donations, which is really great. Um, some of you guys have contributed. Thank you very much. I've gotten a lot of people in Acadiana uh, contributing as well. And I sell merchandise, that's my logo. I sell hoodies for people, hoodies for dogs, whatever you want. Um, it was on my merch. And then I also had this idea when I was rowing down the Mississippi. Um, I saw that an ocean rower had put names of, of sponsors and donors that had contributed. And I said, well, you know what would be cool is instead of a name, that I just had people create their own stickers and put whatever they want on them, put something that means something to them, put a picture of their family, put a logo of their business. And I want my boat to, in the end, look more like a patchwork quilt instead of a billboard. So this is about half. I've, I've sold about 20 stickers so far. Um, and these are just an example of some of the designs I've gotten. I like, I like them quite a bit. And you, you can just get a sticker and put whatever you want on it, and that image uh, will go with me around the world. And I'm going to put them on my aft cabin so that I can see what I'm doing. Um, and I think these stickers are going to mean a lot more to me than the money because that's something I'm really going to need to know that I have other people aboard with me and I'm not alone. So anyway, uh, my website is there, Ellen Magellan. M-A-G-E-L-L-A-N, like Ferdinand Magellan. I had to look up how he spelled it, so that's okay if you do too. Um, if you go to my website, you can sign up for a newsletter, um, and I'll be sending uh, either once a week or once every two weeks, I'll be sending captain's logs, and you can see what I've been up to, and uh, also social media, if any of y'all are on there, Ellen Magellan Expeditions, it's all over. And uh, yeah, the little pop-up will look like that on my website, so put your email in. No spam, don't worry, only interesting stuff. Thank you. And, and don't worry about me, because I do these presentations, and then after I'm done, I, I could just feel it. I could feel people were like, are you going to be OK? <laughs> and you know, at the end of the day, I, I'm, I, the way I see it is we're in just living our lives we are anywhere else in the world. We all drove here. I ride my bicycle. You know, why live a life of safety when anything can happen to you and not do what you want to do. Just do what you want to do and whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And this, is, this trip is not a death wish. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's a wish to live as much as possible. And I'm going to go for it. And that's, I feel like most people here, most people I talk to are more proud and more jealous than they are worried. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to be OK. But uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, let's let sure let's do questions because that's the end. I went kind of fast. A few. Um, <laughs> I'll come back to you. A little rapid fire, but so are you going to have a satellite? I didn't mention that. Thank you for for bringing that up. So. Oh, okay, so he says, am I going to have satellite? Um, I did forget to mention that when I talked about emergency equipment. So I have five ways of communicating with the world that I'm in distress. Um, I'm going to have two EPIRBs, which are emergency personal locating beacon, something like that, EPIRB. And then a B, which is like an EPIRB, but smaller and clips to you. And then I have a satellite phone, and then my VHF radio also has Mayday on it. So I have five ways. And then the satellite phone, I could hook up to my iPhone and send uh, short videos and photos from C. Are you going to have a shot photo? I will not. No. I'll have a ground crew back, back at home, but uh, that's it. What, what's, what do you perceive, aside from the health stuff, what do you perceive as the biggest threat? And how do you... Or show yourself to these big giant boats and tankers. Okay, you said well, you, those two questions in one. Okay. <laughs> so I, he I said he said, what is the biggest threat, and yeah. and how do I make myself known to other traffic, especially offshore container ships, which are like floating islands. Yeah. Um, so I think the biggest threat, I mean the weather for sure, but I, I, I've always considered people my greatest threat. Um, I've traveled 10,000 miles, most of it solo, as a woman, and I stay far away from people. I think that at the end of the day that they're, they're the most dangerous animal. I go, I'll tell you a quick story, I go rowing in the, in the Atchafalaya Basin quite a bit in my canoe, and I get these people come by in their motorboats and they're looking at me like I got a third arm coming out my chest. They just don't understand that there's a rowboat, number one, and there's a woman alone. And they tell me, they go, you know, there's a lot of alligators out here. And I go, 
With all respect, I'm in more danger of being harmed by you. <laughs> and they know I have an answer for that because they know I'm right. So I think that's my biggest threat. And then the traffic, so I was talking about the collision avoidance on the AIS. So hopefully uh, the offshore riggers can see me. The problem with an ocean rowboat is there's no high point to affix your radio antenna or, or your AIS. Um, so what I'm gonna get is a radar reflector, either an active or a passive radar reflector to try to make my signal a little bit brighter. How long do you anticipate? Great question, so it's about 40,000 around seven years, could be five, could be 10, I'm 26. <laughs> yeah, I'll have a hand line so I can catch some fresh food. Uh, it depends on where I am in the expedition. If I'm island hopping in the Caribbean, then I don't need to bring a year's worth of food with me. If I'm crossing the Pacific, then yes, I do. So just like any resupply, when you're resupplying, you just got to know how long it is until your next resupply and buy accordingly. And Steve, look in the mirror. You need a lot more food than cheetah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'll get to you. When are you, when are you leaving and don't forget to pack your sunscreen? <laughs> Yeah, thanks mom. <laughs> Don't forget to pack your sunscreen. <laughs> um, I'm leaving September 3rd uh, uh, this year, which is actually the day that my brother died six years ago in 2016. Uh, I was doing the planning and I realized that I needed to be in Florida around December. It means I need to leave Texas around September. I was like, okay, September, maybe like early September. And then I was like, September 3rd, serendipity. So um, I think that it's very good full circle to bring that around. Mr. Rick. How about the barnacle stuff? Oh, great. I'm glad you brought that up because this is wild, man. You got to jump into the water every two or three and clean the barnacles off the bottom of your boat. So that's a pretty intense sounding. Is there a Do you use an anti-fouling on the bottom? Uh, I already have an anti-fouling on it. That's the orange that you see there. Yeah, I had to get the boat anti-fouled. And uh, I was like, hey, man, if you're going to paint the bottom of my boat, uh, just make it orange. I don't know any other ro ocean rowboat that has an orange bottom, but why wouldn't? I mean, it just makes sense to me. But I did not consider how much it made the boat look like a cork. <laughs> but uh, I do want it to float, so. <laughs> With the bark, is there a way to, to have a, some kind of a tube or something to get air when you're under the boat to be able to get your job done without having to continually burn? No, I just uh, have to hold my breath. I, I want to take a free diving course when I get to Florida uh, so I can go down and retrieve my anchor if I need to and be able to more efficiently clean the barnacle. Someone else had a question? Do you carry a weapon? Great question. Um, so I, I have not carried a weapon down on any of my expeditions. Um, this one especially I won't because I'm passing through so many international ports. I just can't clear customs that many times with a firearm. What I can bring is a spear gun, bear spray, wasp spray, pepper spray. You know, so I can bring something to defend myself, but a firearm is just not going to clear customs. Absolutely, piracy is, especially in the Caribbean. Uh, of course, the Somalian pirates are off the east coast of Africa. The New Age pirates are off the west coast of Africa, and the Caribbean's still full of them. Um, I'm the most valuable thing on that boat, so really at the end of the day, they're probably just going to look at me like I'm insane, uh, which is what most people look at me like. But w most people, when they see me on the water, think that I'm a demasted sailboat in distress. Um, so, I mean, just I want to tell you about that. I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in danger of being swiped up and kidnapped just by being a woman in the world who is alone most of the time, you know, at sea or on land. <laughs> what? A bomb? <laughs> it was a book a year. No, sir, I'm going to... I'm, I'm rowing home. So I don't want to stay somewhere and then catch a flight back and leave my boat. Come back until I come back. And if that means I have to stay at a um, The reason this trip will probably take years is because the thing of it is that when I'm finished a major crossing, I'm probably going to at the beginning of hurricane season in that part of the world. So I'll have to stay for three or four months and let hurricane season pass before I continue on. And I could just, you know, I don't know, write, pick up a job, Monica, you know, I'll just find something to do until the hurricane pass. What wave? 40 feet, 60 feet during a hurricane storm, big storm, something like that.
But what I really like about these boats, I'm not a sailor, I've never sailed, but I understand sailing, I understand how it works, but in my mind, I feel safer in a boat like this that's made to capsize than a sailor. If that capsizes, I don't know, you're basically, I don't know how that oh, Yeah, there are 40 foot waves, but I'm in a cork. So, I don't know, it just makes more sense to me. And there is a harness in the aft cabin as well. Uh, I don't know if you can tell in the picture, um, a, a harness that across my legs and my torso so I can strap myself in the harness during rough seas. Uh, and then that way when the boat capsizes, all 110 pounds of me <laughs> be on the top and help pull the boat. How frequent are the capsizes? Like if you're in a storm, there's multiple times you I, I'm assuming. I mean, I don't know. And ocean rowboats have been known to capsize just like off of a free but it's like a pretty pretty clear day, pretty normal conditions, and just a freak wave comes and swamps you. So that's why you be prepared at all times, even on a glassy ocean. You know, I don't know, what if a whale I'm just, doors closed at all times. Be ready for a capsize at any point. Has anybody else tried to do this? Great question. So no. Uh, actually, it has been attempted. Um, when I first started planning this expedition, I didn't know that nobody had ever done it before. I just knew that I hadn't done it. Um, <laughs> that's the most important thing. Uh, like three years ago, by this Russian monk named Fedor. He's like an a, a, I don't know, Orthodox priest or something. He's really famous in Russia, and he was going to row around the world in a Rannoch boat. He rowed from Peru to Australia, and he got to Australia, and he called it off. <laughs> Um, and it has not been successfully pulled off. Um, people have gone around the world on human power, um, but what these people do is they'll row across an ocean, they'll get to a landmass, they'll get on a bicycle, shift their boat to the other side of the landmass, and then go and meet their boat on the other side. So human power navigations have been done, I want to say five or six times, but row entirely has not been done. And even if it has been done, even if someone does it before me, what am I going to do? Not watch the sunset because other people have seen the sunset before? Like, I'm still going to go do it. It doesn't matter if 100 people have done it. I have done it. And it was never my intention to be the first person to do anything. It just happened that way. Not immediate. Uh, what? Three news right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all the media has happened very organically. I haven't reached out to anybody. I've been featured in uh, Paddling Magazine, which is the number one magazine in the United States for paddling. I've been featured in newspapers, podcasts, radios, and it's all happened organically. I haven't reached out to anybody, and that's how I'm, I'm anticipating. It's just going to snowball from here. Um, and who knows? I mean, I, I might be on Good Morning America when I get back or something. I don't know. I don't care, really. <laughs> Would you describe your biggest personal obstacle? The Can I have a moment to think about that? <laughs> um, I mean, French, maybe? Uh, am I? Am I? No, no. I I don't speak any languages other than English, mostly. <laughs> um, I I'm, I speak a little Spanish and a little French. I'll pick it up along the way. <laughs> That's a very good point. I could. <laughs> that would be the worst. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, th I'm thinking, I'm still thinking. My, uh, my biggest personal obstacle, I think, will be <sighs> the same obstacles I would face if I was here. It's the days that you wake up and you're doing the same thing that you did yesterday. You, you know, you're going to work to the same job you've been doing for however long. I'm rowing the same boat that I've been rowing for three years now. Um, nothing is like catastrophic, everything is boring, and nothing is new, but these are all challenges I would face if I was a flight instructor for the rest of my life. There will be days that I'll wake up and I want to get out of bed, go to work, and I'd, or I don't want to get on the oars. Those are all things, I'm going to experience highs and lows in my life no matter what I do, so I might as well be doing something that I want to be doing. hope that answered your question. What's your longest ferry stretch? Like open ocean? Yeah. Uh, the Pacific. It's 8,000 miles. Uh, it could take anywhere between 8 to 10, possibly 12 months. So are you planning to hit island chains all throughout? Yeah, for sure. Polynesia. Yeah. But uh, the crossing from Panama to French Polynesia is about 8,000 miles. So, yeah. Great question. Uh, 
a pharmacy. <laughs> so of course a normal first aid kit, but then what I'm also going to have on board is a kit of a bunch of pharmaceuticals, prescription medications, and each pill will be labeled with a number. And then on my satellite phone I'm going to have a teledoc, and the teledoc will have a case that has the exact same labeled pills in it. And I describe to the doc, okay these are my symptoms, he goes great, pill number 27 is this and this and this, take that for five days, call me later. And that's you can listen to a bunch of audible books. Oh, I've gotten that. I've gotten that from Ocean Rowers. They're like, you got to get audiobooks because you're going to go crazy. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> I actually do have a stereo system on the boat. It doesn't work, which of all things not to work on the boat, I'm okay with that. <laughs> Anyone? Share what the boat costs. Boop, boop, boop. Huh? Share what the boat costs. Do you really want to know? <laughs> All right, I'll be, I'll be honest with y'all. Uh, the boat, I paid $40,000 for the boat in the dockyard. It's a used boat. She was built in 2015, and the history of it is she was commissioned to be built by this man who wanted to row across the Atlantic. And so he had Rannoch build him this custom boat, and then he hired a skipper to help row him across the Atlantic. They got 300 miles into the expedition, and the guy decided that he uh, didn't want anything to do with this, wanted to get pulled off the water. They pulled him off the water, towed the boat back to England, or back to Africa, and then shipped it back to England. And it's been sitting in the boatyard ever since. So $40,000 after the boatyard for like three or four years, straight off. I added $20,000 of modifications to it to get it up to speed after sitting in the boatyard for that long, as well as other custom additions for the expedition, like two batteries and the custom rudder. Um, and then I had to pay for shipping. So the whole thing is about $75,000. I've been eating beanie weenies for the last two years, y'all. <laughs> but uh, that's what you gotta do to make the dream. My last one. Why did you fly across the world? Like what, what prompted you to go to Rowan? Um, I, I like human power. I've gotten this question from sailors. They go, why don't you just sail? Why don't you just fly? Why don't you sail? Why don't you do something easier? Um, and you know, if I ever have, if I've never been in a sailboat before, but I kind of don't want to because I feel like the moment I get in a sailboat, I'm going to be like, well, this is easy. I don't know what I'm doing rowing. Um, I like human powered things. I've done 10,000 miles of human power and I like it because it pushes your body and when your body gets pushed that much your mind follows and your mind ends up going to that extreme and the kinds of art and the kinds of things I find there I can only find if I push my body that far too. So I like, I like to suffer. <laughs> you mentioned like 40 to 60 foot seas are expected. At that point you're tethered in your cabin I would imagine like what are the conditions where you're like, I'm still doing my 12 hours of rowing, like as far as like the extreme conditions where you're pressing forward? Well, I mean, you can get rowing in 40 foot seas. Uh, you just might get thrown overboard a whole lot. It, it really just depends on the chop and it depends on the water levels too. So if it's really deep, you could take a lot more chop because the waves are more rolling. But if you're in, in the Caribbean where it's shallower, the waves are choppier. Maybe you have opposing winds and currents. Maybe the wind isn't that bad, but since it's opposing, you just have to play it by ear. What, what, is this safe or not? And then it might be safer to keep rowing than it would be to drop anchor. These are all, this is, we call ADM, aeronautical decision making in, in aviation, right? These are all ADM decisions that you have to make as a captain and go, you know, what, what are my boundaries? And then as you gain experience, your tolerance for that will, will change. So you just have to play it by ear and be, be captain of your ship, make the safest decisions. Silence. Yeah, he's, he's going to be my figurehead. <laughs> going east first, because I have to get to Panama, and all the winds in the Caribbean are easterly, which is a bit of an issue. Um, so I'm not really sure how I'm going to get to Panama, but I know I need to get to Florida first. So I'm going to go to Florida and talk to the sailors there and, and, and develop a plan there. Also, to the U.S. Coast Guard and uh, Customs in Key West and get the situation on Cuba. So um, I'm just, what I do when I travel is I talk to the people around me. I talk to locals, I talk to the other travelers, and I develop an idea of what's ahead and I make my decisions off of that. So I'm going to go to Florida and out from there. I mean, in September 3rd, right? 
Great point. It sure is, uh, <laughs> as we all know. So I did. I rode the ICW 600 miles from Louisiana to Texas in 2020 during hurricane season. And since I'm on the ICW, I'm inland. And when a hurricane came, I just got pulled off the water. So that's what I'm going to do on my way to Florida. I'll just if if, it, if a hurricane looks like it's like really going to wreck shop and headed directly towards me, I'll get someone, <clears throat> my parents, um, to come bring my trailer and pull me. Inland. Um, and this is sort of like a training run also. Since I've done 600 miles of the ICW already, I'm familiar with the dangers involved. So I'll be on a route that I've already rode, a boat that I'm getting to know. So hopefully by the time I get to Florida, I'll have a lot more idea of what I want set up before I go to the open ocean. Answered all your questions? We're talking about, no, we won't. You were talking about staying in Slidell for a while and kind of getting the... Uh, I committed to I was and all that. Yeah, I was, but um I, I got the boat here and I got all the gear here, not all of it, but I got a lot of the gear here and I realized I really need like a building. Like spread out all my gear and, and figure things out. I was I was planning on living aboard the boat until I left, but I I don't think that's realistic. So I'm I just decided I'm gonna find somewhere I might go back home. I might find I don't know. I don't know yet. I just a space to lay out stuff and I'm also working on a book right now so I've got a lot of things going on. I don't really have time to live aboard the boat right now I'll be living aboard for seven years yeah. <laughs> well, on the job training you'll be out there and as you go into the ocean you will learn exactly how to handle. yeah like I mean uh, when I started rowing down the Mississippi River I'd never before, but I figure if I can't figure it out in 2100 miles I'm never gonna figure it out so if I can't figure out how to row an open ocean rowboat in seven years I'm never gonna figure it out I'm gonna do the training here just to be safe and get my licenses and ratings and I'll figure out everything else along the way so what is your commitment to finishing this like say you run up on some Caribbean island or something somewhere and you're just the best place in the world and meet somebody or have a relationship or you know the I've, I've been traveling for five years now and the hardest thing about traveling is the amount of times you have to say goodbye. It doesn't get easier. I just feel like when I'm traveling, I'm just saying goodbye over and over and over. And that's just part of it. That's just the life of the vagrant. And I might find a spot that I like. Maybe I will stay uh, for four weeks instead of one or something like that. But I'm, I'm committed. I, if it takes me until I'm 80 years old to finish this, I, I want to do this. And I did have the thought, um, I'm 26 years old. I'll be 27 in a couple weeks. And I mean, I do want to have a family, right, at some point. And I figured, you know, if, I, if this takes 10 years, I'll come back, I'll be, you know, mid to late 30s. That's, that's fine, I could still have kids. But what if this takes me 20 years? You know, what if this takes me 30? And so I had to make the decision, I go, if I'm lying on my deathbed and I haven't had kids, but I've done this expedition, well, I feel better about that than if I had kids and didn't do this expedition. And I made the decision that it's more important to me to do this expedition and whatever happens, happens. I have a lot of time to think about this. <laughs> so can we assume that you have no sweetie at this present time? No, I mean, I've got a line of them. <laughs> Get in line, buddy. No, I mean, any, anyone, that I'm, uh, anyone that I'm hanging out with knows what I'm up to. It's, it's sort of like a disclaimer. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm a vagrant. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to be in one spot for very long. And that's just, but I, in, in some ways, I have found that it makes uh, meetings with people more intense because you know, like, the time is precious. And time is precious anyway, but now it's like more, you're more aware of it. And it just makes those moments brief, but like more powerful. And I don't know. I found a way to, to enjoy my travels and make connections. I don't know. Still thinking about it. You gonna keep a diary? Absolutely. So if you sign up to my newsletters, uh, every one or two weeks, um, at least twice a month, I'm gonna post captain's logs. And uh, I'm a writer. I don't have anything published yet, but like I said, I'm working on a book. So I'm basically just be uh, p basically writing a book as along the way. And I'm interested to see uh, what sort of art I create out there at sea. Will your vessel be on marine traffic? It will, yeah, yeah. So you can type in the name and it'll show up on marine traffic for sure. Good questions. <laughs> <laughs>